Welcome to this podcast and YouTube clip with Michael Hudson. Now, Michael doesn't need any introductions, but let me give you a, a very short one as to his CV, which is very impressive indeed. He's the president of the Institute for the Study of Long-Term Economic Trends, ISLA, a very well-known financial and economic analyst. And he's always also the distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas, which, if people who have paid attention to our previous YouTube clips, is something that is already, we hope, going to be rivaling the old Chicago School of Economics based on a very neoliberal view of the way the economy should be run. Michael was also one of the very few band of merry men and women to predict the impending crisis, particularly through the asset bubbles. And we just want to say thank you, Michael, for being able to spend a little time with Union Solidarity International. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Great. Well, listen, I think the to kick off our conversation, Michael, you, of course, have got a, a new book out called the, the Bubble and Beyond, which is also featured on your website and very helpfully pulled up on the screen for us. Michael, do you want to just give us a synopsis of what the book is about and maybe we can delve into some of the themes behind it? The basic premise is that we're going into a period of debt deflation. In other words, the debt has grown so much after World War II uh, that right now people are... Uh, uh, having to spend their income to pay the bankers rather than uh, to spend on goods and services and that's why markets are shrinking and that's why employment is shrinking. Uh, when uh, America, England and other countries emerged from World War II uh, they were relatively free of debt. Uh, governments had run up debt but there was very little for consumers to buy in the war so there was very little consumer debt there wasn't very much mortgage debt. Uh, corporations were relatively free of debt. And uh, every uh, expansion uh, that's occurred uh, since World War II, every financial cycle, and the business cycle is basically a financial cycle, has started from a larger and larger and larger uh, amount of debt to be paid off. And that's like driving a car with your foot on the brakes, uh, having to stop the brakes. And we're in a situation today where in America, one quarter of uh, American real estate is in negative equity. That means the mortgage debt is larger than the property is worth. And of course, in Ireland, it's much worse. Now, in the past, uh, throughout most of antiquity, throughout most of recorded human history, when the debts have got so large, they're written down. Uh, in ancient society, Sumer, Babylonia, the Near East, uh, the uh, uh, Jubilee Law in uh, uh, Jewish countries, uh, the debts were written down periodically or when a new ruler uh, took the throne. Uh, traditionally, in uh, recent times in Europe and America, uh, when there was a crisis, uh, the bad debts would be uh, wiped out, and with it the savings. And that's a good thing about wiping out debts. The problem today isn't only debts, it's the savings of the 1%. And the problem for Ireland and for Europe is uh, this, uh, these savings are in the hands of bankers, usually foreign. So Ireland has run up foreign debt, it's run up a debt to the banks. And ideally, what Ireland should do, and what America should do, and other countries, is to write down the debts to the ability to pay. And in practice, this means writing them off. Uh, the last time this was done really successfully was in 1948 in Germany with the Allied Monetary Reform. Uh, it was easy to cancel the debts then because most of the uh, savings were held by the Nazis. So the Allies started Germany debt-free. That was its economic miracle. This idea of a free market was uh, debt-free. And if you look at uh, discussions throughout the 19th century, uh, all of the ideas uh, uh, against English landlords uh, and later the British bankers were to free economies 
from the free lunch taken by uh, the landlords, by the bankers, and later by the monopolists. So the idea of free market today has been turned upside down, and the universities, certainly in this country, have dropped the history of economic thought from the curriculum so that nobody remembers that the idea of a free market was a market free of economic rent, free of landlord uh, ripoffs, and free of payments to the bankers, uh, you would bring prices in line with the actual cost of production. Uh, if that were done, there'd be a lot more uh, consumer demand, there'd be a lot more uh, power uh, demand for labor, and uh, your living standards would be much higher instead of uh, having uh, your increase of income siphoned off uh, to pay the bankers today, which are the equivalent of the British landlords in Ireland a century ago. Thank you for that very, very comprehensive overview of what your book's about, Michael. And just to pick up on a, a couple of themes, obviously doing a little bit of reading and research on your, on your book and indeed your previous work, I'm interested in picking up in the the nice abbreviation FIRE, which you've used, which I think is absolutely fantastic to talk about the the change of an industrial, what could be de defined as industrial capitalism to financialization, and that how indeed this was based on what you have described as the finance, insurance, and real estate sector FIRE. I would just like to tease out a little bit more from you behind that abbreviation well, well, more uh, of the, the damage the damage that's been done by fire and indeed financialization, because it has meant that when our eggs have been put in the one basket, such as the finance sector, our ability to try and grow our way out of the economy is hampered and hindered even more. There's been a symbiosis between banking and finance. A hundred years ago, uh, throughout the 19th century. People believed that banking was going to be industrialized and brought into the sphere of industrial capitalism and that banking uh, would uh, do what it did in Germany and in Central Europe and would basically fund commerce uh, and industry. Uh, and by funding industry, it would uh, create a demand for labor and uplift society. Uh, but that was not what happened in the English-speaking countries. Uh, in contrast to Europe, uh, uh, and especially Germany, Austria, Central Europe, uh, British banking was always based simply on uh, what the banker could foreclose on is the assets. Uh, and a hundred years ago, the big fight was how do you uh, democratize land and uh, give people the right to the land instead of having to pay tribute to the uh, uh, heirs of the families that invaded uh, the British Isles and the Norman Conquest and gave themselves the land and the right to extract rent, land rent. Well, as it turned out, the land has been democratized, but it obviously had to be democratized on credit because the land wasn't simply distributed to the families uh, of uh, the British Isles or other countries. Uh, families had to borrow from the bank at, at uh, interest. And uh, what they did was, if you're buying property in Ireland, you, uh, or England, or America, or Australia, uh, family of the buyers bid against each other, and the winner is whoever can borrow the most money from the bank uh, to buy the property. And the banker will say, well, all right, all right how much uh, rent or rental value, if you're a homeowner, does the property throw off? And, uh, so the result is that the land rent is turned into interest, and interest grows and grows and grows. And the result is that finance today is even more predatory than the landlords were a century ago. When uh, William Nassau Sr. in England was told that a million Irishmen had died in the potato famine, he said, that is not enough. Economically, it wasn't enough to create what economists call equilibrium. Well, today, as the Irish uh, are leaving the country, is they're becoming impoverished, uh, as their health and their public re and their resources are uh, eroded, uh, the bankers are saying, that is not enough austerity. To pay the debts that are way in excess of what you can sell the land for, you have to uh, 
cut back even more. You have to sell off whatever the government has uh, to privatize it. You have to sell off your assets. And essentially, you have to spend the rest of your lives and your family members who are liable for your debts have to spend the rest of their lives uh, paying off the bank loans that you've taken on. This is crazy. This is neo-feudalism. This is the image, and yet that's not what uh, people somehow believe that they owe uh, the money. Uh, Donald Trump would walk away from the land. American, uh, American real estate investment companies, Wall Street banks, walk away from the property. Uh, but somehow there is an ethic that uh, because people have uh, borrowed the money, they actually owe the money even when they can't pay it, and even when the price of trying to repay their mortgage debt, their personal loans, and now their student loan debt for an education uh, is uh, essentially going into a shrinking economy that's going to lower their living standards and essentially drive the economy under and make the debts unpayable in any case because a debt uh, that grows at compound interest can't be paid out of a shrinking economy. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. And of course, we've seen the latest economic statistics across Europe, but across the world, we're seeing some of the the manufacturing indices in Japan and in China. We're also seeing it in North America as well about the global contraction really taking hold now. And what in other countries around the world, such as China and Brazil, that people thought could help the global economy power its way to some sort of growth and we're seeing a number of these economies, the major economies of our world of course, contracting in a very dangerous picture indeed because as we see in the Eurozone growing, not growing at all, Germany barely able to keep its head above the water at 0.3% because of its export markets to the Eurozone and you know what is happening in the States at the moment despite there being a modicum of growth, the unemployment being a, a very, very serious issue in the United States. I just want to pick up on two issues, Michael, that of course are correlated, that sovereign debt and also private debt and how they reinforce one another. You've just given the, an analysis of how debt compounding the problem and about people in nation states being unable to pay their way out of the, the issues that they find themselves in. What do you think, Michael, from your analysis, is the only hope for Greece at the moment? I know you've been someone who's been a proponent of the concept of debt jubilees. Is that and indeed the proponent of debt jubilees? Is that the only way that a country such as Greece can get out of the, the, the problems it finds itself in? Well, there's a basic mathematical fact at work, and that is a debt that can't be paid won't be. There is no way that Greece can pay its debt any more than Ireland can, uh, except by going into a chronic uh, depression and having most of its population emigrate, uh, like the Irish did uh, in the 19th century. So the question is, how aren't the debts going to be paid? And there are only two ways not to repay debts. One is to simply do what's happened for the last 800 years. You simply wipe them out. The debt's wiped out, and then the bankers lose, or the bondholders lose, and the 1% that's doubled its share of the returns to wealth in the last 30 years will be returned to what they were 30 years ago. All these, this predatory 1% will lose its uh, savings, which are its claims on debt to the bottom 99%. Uh, the, uh, if you don't have a debt write-off, a jubilee, then the alternative is that the debtor has to sell the resources. And of course the Irish debtors, uh, homeowners, uh, real estate people didn't have their resources to pay. So the bankers have bought control of the government and they say, okay, the government has to uh, make all of the creditors uh, whole, meaning uh, you let them keep what they've taken and uh, you uh, then have the government owe the money and uh, you have to, uh, the government now has to part with whatever real estate or rights it has. So you're having throughout the country, not only in Greece and Ireland, but in Chicago, in California, 
uh, in other states and cities here, cities are selling off their road, public roads and turning them into toll roads. Chicago has sold off the right to put parking meters on sidewalks and charge off of the parking. Uh, cities or uh, states are selling off uh, the real estate, they're selling off uh, the town halls, they're selling off uh, the capital and then leasing them back. They're selling off the buildings. The whole economy of the world is being factorized. Uh, and what's happening to the rest of the world is what's happened in England, and it's not a pretty sight. Absolutely. I don't think anybody in the progressive side of economics or anybody who understands economics for that matter would disagree with your analysis, Michael. Could you just explain a little bit further how a debt jubilee would work, about the mechanics of that? Because, of course, a number of years ago, at the turn of the millennium, we seen what at face value seemed to be countries in Africa having X percentage of their debt wiped off. How would this work? Did that work, for, for example? And how would your idea of a write-off of debt in practical terms work? There were there are many different forms of the Jubilee. Uh, I'm very disappointed in the Jubilee 2000 and the debt write-offs because the Jubilee the way the Jubilee uh, in Europe is worked is it's a giveaway to the banks. Uh, the people who are running the Jubilee are essentially lobbyists for the banking sector. What they say is the African countries and the third world countries don't have enough money to pay both the senior creditors, namely the governments and the IMF and the World Bank, and the banks. We're working for the banks. We want you to cancel the debts that uh, these countries can't pay that they owe to the senior creditors, the governments and the bank, and the uh, IMF and the World Bank, so that they can pay our clients, the bankers. Uh, and so Bono and the others, while thinking they're helping the third world countries, are really not cutting a single penny of debt service off the third world countries. They're saying, pay the commercial bankers and the vulture investors and the bondholders, not uh, the government. So they've arranged only a partial uh, uh, write down of, uh, of seni seniority. Uh, a real jubilee is writing off the debt, the government debts, period. Uh, to, uh, across the board, uh, including to the bankers, that uh, the only purpose of a jubilee should be to make the debt service less than it otherwise would be. Well, right now, the third world countries are still paying every penny of surplus that they raise uh, to the foreign creditors, just to the bankers, not to other governments. And uh, that's a crazy way of doing things. Uh, when you ask how would a jubilee work, uh, the way that it worked, if you want to spell it all out legally, was all spelled out in the Allied Debt Cancellation of uh, Germany in 1948. Uh, all debts, except those owed by employers to their employees for, you know, the work done, you pay every few weeks or every month, uh, were wiped out. And people were able to keep uh, up to a minimum level of uh, bank deposits uh, that they needed just for transactions purposes, say a thousand dollars or today it would probably be a hundred thousand uh, dollars, they were able to keep it in the bank, but all of the uh, other surplus debts over and above this was uh, annulled and there was a clean slate, because that's really what a uh, jubilee is, it's a clean slate. It's not what the Jubilee uh, for third world countries was. That was only pay our clients to the bankers, not governments, to pay every penny that you have and impose poverty on yourself to pay our clients the bankers. That's not a Jubilee. That's that's a trick. Uh, or it's gullibility by people who think they'd like to help the third world. Uh, most, most of the uh, Jubilee people in Europe were just plain gullible because they didn't do a balance sheet analysis of who are the debts owed to, how much is going to be paid, how much uh, really do the save for the third world. Uh, and is the third, third world simply paying its debts to domestic bankers, not to foreign bankers. Uh, uh, so basically, Jubilee is writing down debts, writing off, starting with a clean slate. This was done for uh, thousands of years from Sumer, Babylonia, uh, and you have, uh, each time a new ruler would take the throne in Sumer or Babylonia, they would start the rule with a clean slate, canceling the personal debts 
uh, the agrarian debts. They'd leave the commercial debts in place. There's no reason commercial debts should be in place. But we're talking public debts, and we're talking about uh, personal debts. Now, each ruler, uh, the, the creditors always tried to get lawyers to rewrite to find loopholes. And so by the time you got the Edict of Amisadita in 1648 BC, you had a very detailed uh, debt uh, jubilee, uh, debt cancellation, which uh, would cancel the debts, would return the land to uh, families that had forfeited them and would liberate uh, the people, uh, whoever was in bondage to the creditors. You had more detail uh, debt like that. Yeah, very interesting indeed, Michael. And I suppose the issues that came to the forefront in the millennium regarding Africa are for for Europe uh, at the moment a similar sort of scenario as we would understand because the issue being that who is the debt actually being paid to and over the last couple of years we've seen this protracted elongated process in the Eurozone about trying to find uh, a way in order for other, other banks and financial institutions to try and firewall themselves against what many people would think would be a Greek exit from the Eurozone. And what many people in Europe say is that the sovereign debt crisis and the pain that a country in Greece in particular is facing, but as we also see Spain, is all about paying off foreign and foreign private and financial institutions. It's the same scenario which you've just outlined to us, and indeed in Africa. Is that something that you would agree with? Yes, uh, and the thing, the thing is that all of this is unnecessary. Uh, the banks create credit, which means debts for their clients. They create it on their own computer keyboard. So, uh, just like when you go into a bank and you borrow money, uh, we're not talking about savings. The banks will simply uh, say, okay, sign this IOU, and we'll give you a bank account, uh, this money in your a bank account. So this is created on a keyboard. Uh, governments can do exactly the same thing. They can spend their money into circulation. Uh, that's how the Americans uh, financed the Civil War with the greenbacks. Uh, it's how uh, governments have the power to create money with their own central bank. But Europe doesn't have a central bank. Uh, somehow the whole European idea was hijacked by the bankers to say, uh, you, uh, you can only create money with your central bank to pay the bankers and to buy bonds from the banks and to save us from losing money. You, are, uh, the, you and the central bank cannot create money to lend the government. You cannot create credit to increase production. You cannot create credit to finance your social spending or public investment or infrastructure investment. Just the opposite. Not only must you uh, only make money to uh, create money to lend and give away to the bankers, but you have to sell off your property and privatize it. So somehow uh, the European idea today is Thatcherism. Uh, that you have to dismantle the government and essentially let the uh, financial sector and the banks do what it used to take an army to do. In 1066, England had to be conquered by the Northmen, by the Normans, uh, to grab the land in order to obtain it. But today, without having to mount a military invasion, you can do it legally just on a computer keyboard by writing off debt and foreclosing on the land. In England, in Greece, in uh, Latvia, in Iceland, uh, and somehow the population doesn't even know that it's being invaded and under financial attack. Michael, that's a fantastic way of putting that. Uh, very illuminating indeed to use that uh, metaphor uh, about the, the scenario that people are not aware of the the invasion of financial institutions in their everyday life. And I just want to come on to talk about that particular issue because I think we've discussed the sovereign debt issue about how we could have a debt jubilee. How would that work for private individuals, Michael? Because in our previous conversations with Steve Keane, for example, who's a, who, what, what, he's a, a very strong and very articulate man when it comes to describing the the impact of private debt on 
economies and on societies. So how would a debt jubilee work for individuals? Bearing in mind that private debt to GDP ratios could run into the hundreds of percents. There are many different ways. Uh, one way uh, would be simply, is for starters, the minimum way would be what was uh, President Obama had promised to do in America, but he had no intention at all of living through. What he promised to do and broke his promise was that he was going to write down the mortgage debt to the current value of the property. Uh, wasn't done, uh, because, uh, because basically, basically he's a lobbyist uh, for the, his campaign contributors who are mainly for Wall Street. Another way, uh, the, uh, that's the marginal extreme. The other way would be to write down the debt uh, totally and say everybody's free of debt except for uh, the landlords. Well, the problem is if you free uh, landlords free of debt, uh, most uh, commercial investors like Donald Trump or uh, the Helmsleys uh, bar use other people's money. Uh, and so uh, one example of this was what was done in Sparta in uh, the 3rd century BC. Uh, the kings of Sparta uh, in Greece were in pretty much like Greece is in the same position uh, the early 3rd century BC that it was today. And uh, uh, the rich people uh, were taking over. But there was also a lot of speculation in buying real estate and credit. So Plutarch, in his life of Aegis and Cleomenes, the kings of Greece, uh, when they canceled, they were convinced by the real estate speculators to write down the debt, and then you'd have the real estate speculators being the richest people. So uh, what needs to be introduced to any financial discussion is the fiscal and tax reform have to be part and parcel of any financial restructuring. Uh, that uh, if you write down uh, and get rid of the debt on real estate, what are you going to do about the land rent? Well, basically the land rent should be the basis for taxation. Uh, Steve Keen and I are often talking about this. Uh, we're writing a paper right now, a joint paper that we're giving in Chicago next month and in Kansas City uh, next month on this, this very issue. Uh, where uh, you have to uh, shift the tax to the land, which of course was exactly the great 19th century cry by the physiocrats of France, by Adam Smith, by John Stuart Mill, by the progressive era of reformers. Uh, that the basic, you don't want a free lunch. You want to tax away the free lunch of either land ownership, the site value, or a financial privilege, or a monopoly privilege. Well, the Chicago School today, in contrary right to the uh, our Kansas City, Missouri school, is uh, the economy is all about a free lunch. That's what banking is. Bankers only lend against the free lunch. They don't lend for capital investment in industry. They don't lend for direct investment. They don't lend for employment. They only want to grab the monopoly rights because it's easier to do that than to actually invest in production and develop new markets for it and employing labor. So what you really have in uh, Europe is uh, the fight that we would like to see is what should be the fight between bankers and labor. If the bankers win, they win at not only at labor's expense by taking whatever can be squeezed out of the workforce, but they shrink the economy so much that the Europeans as a whole are going to have emigrants. Uh, like, like the Irish emigrated in the 19th, 19th century. The, the Baltic states and the Latvians already are emigrating. The, the Icelanders were emigrating. The Greeks are emigrating. This, uh, what you have is a result of the financial sector uh, not writing down the debts is you, uh, you give people a choice between debt payage or immigration and they're leaving the country. Just like uh, the banks provide uh, the capital uh, to leave the country, they, uh, uh, the Greek banks refuse to cooperate with the European uh, Union in uh, uh, saying how their clients were laundering money in Switzerland. Uh, the European Central Bank tells Greece, you owe 45 billion uh, euros, and at the same time, uh, the Greek residents have 50 billion euros in Switzerland. Uh, of flight capital. Uh, all of this is, uh, should easily be taxed. So without a tax system to collect the economic rent, you're going to leave this uh, rent yielding property, uh, the land value, uh, monopoly rights, uh, special privileges, available to be pledged 
to banks as interest, and then bought out uh, by speculators uh, in exchange for promising to pay all this economic rent and the free lunch to the banks instead of to the government. Well, by not taxing the free lunch, governments have had to tax labor and industry and uh, shrunk the economy. So the governments have been sucked into this rentier process. Be, again, the symbiosis between uh, the real estate, insurance, and the financial sector that is a predatory, extractive uh, form of income, not the productive income. And 19th century classical economics was all about this. It was about distinguishing productive investment from unproductive investment. Productive credit from unproductive credit. Uh, and uh, all of that has been swept away uh, in the late 19th century by the lobbyists for the Rockies saying there is no such thing as unearned income. Everybody earns whatever they get by definition. So today, if you look at the uh, national income accounts of Europe or America, uh, you have uh, the financial sector counted as adding to national income and national product uh, using financial services, which are the services in taking your money, uh, just like a landlord would collect your rent. That's really not a service. That's a siphoning off of the economic surplus, not a uh, production uh, of uh, the economic surplus. So there's a confusion about what the economy is all about, and this confusion could only be spread by stripping away the history of economic thought from the uh, economics curriculum, and economic history itself from the curriculum, so one doesn't see the disaster that this policy, uh, this uh, that's right policy that's hundreds of years old uh, has caused again and again and again. Thanks for that very detailed and comprehensive response, Michael. Very illuminating. I just want to pick you up on the concept of free lunches and, of course, to discuss it with you a little bit further, knowing your expertise, that, of course, in the last couple of days we've heard more rumours about in the States quantitative easing, quantitative easing 3, QA3. We're hearing about the Eurozone economy is thinking about another injection of what they would call money supply into the economy and Britain is also contemplating doing the same. Now, the, the critique of that, of course, Michael, and I'm sure you'll be able to give a more elaborate response than I would, is that quantitative easing, all that happens is that the banks hoard the money in order to pay down their own exposure to the, the debts that they have given. And in a very fascinating report by The Guardian this week in the UK that showed that the top 5% of the richest people in this country were the only ones to benefit from the previous quantitative easings. Do you want to just say a little bit more about that, Michael, and about perhaps the futility of injecting money into the financial institutions who in turn don't lend it. Well, it's very interesting. You begin by asking your question by saying invest, uh, injecting money into the economy, uh, and then you got it right the second time when you say injecting it into financial institutions. Yes, yeah, so I was being kind. I was being not kind to the Bank of England. <laughs> the money is not going into the economy. The money is going into the banks. Uh, in America, uh, Ben Bernanke said you have to inject money like uh, dropping it out of helicopters. But the helicopter in America only stops on Wall Street. <laughs> not everybody gets it. You don't, uh, the people at large don't get the money. This is not going to labor. This is not going to industry. This is going directly into the banks. Now, the first quant the last year's quantitative easing was $800 billion, where the Federal Reserve lent the money to the banks. The banks did two things with it. Number one, they left it on deposit with the Federal Reserve to get interest. Uh, as a profit, but almost as the uh, Financial Times reported, all of this 800 billion went abroad for currency arbitrage. They would borrow at one quarter of one percent in the United States, and they would lend to Brazil, which was paying over 11 percent. They would lend uh, to China. They would lend to other countries that were paying a higher interest rate. And as this money went into foreign countries, like Australia, it, uh, Australia was raising its interest rates to five and three quarters percent. So the money, you'd, uh, the banks here would take the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing from helicopter Ben Bernanke at a quarter percent. They'd lend to Brazil at 11 percent. They'd lend to Australia at five and three quarters percent. And this inflow into the Brazilian Cruzeiro the Australian dollar forced up their currency uh, 
And so the banks got not only a higher percentage through arbitrage, they got a foreign exchange capital gain. None of this money went into the domestic economy at all. None of this money was used not to pay labor, and in fact, for industry. So in fact, if you're a worker and you're trying to put money aside for your retirement, especially when the companies are annulling their uh, pension funds and the states and localities here are saying there's no money to pay. And uh, you have President Obama saying, uh, I'm going, uh, we have to balance the budget to get rid of Social Security, to privatize it, to downsize Medicare in order to pay my clients, the bankers. Uh, all of this money is going to the banks at the expense of the uh, uh, private sector. Well, right now, the Federal Reserve says there's a problem. The banks have made so many bad loans to their cronies and to themselves that the, the money can't be paid. And uh, they, right now, there's still uh, about one quarter of American real estate in negative equity. We've got to lower the interest rate so much, and now they're three and a half percent in America, that the banks can let, you can borrow money against uh, the rent uh, and somehow raise the prices again to the golden years we had in the bubble. Well, let me tell you, the golden years were rotten. What people called everybody getting rich off the bubble economy was everybody going into debt to a lifetime of debt thinking they could get rich by looking at the value of the house not realizing that all of this value was bid up by bank debt and when the prices collapsed the bank debt remained in place so that's why there's negative equity here the federal reserve is trying to keep the prices the banks uh, liquid enough so they can lend enough money to reflate uh, the prices back to the bubble le levels so that if you buy a home, if you have security, you have to go into 30 years debt and pay all of whatever you can uh, earn in your lifetime to pay for the house. That's the idea that the banks have and that's what they call equilibrium. And uh, that's a rotten concept of equilibrium. And that's what the, the quantitative easing here is trying to do. It's what they're trying to do in Europe. They're saying we're going to make uh, credit so easy that the banks in Spain Portugal, Ireland can somehow lend enough money so maybe it's easy enough for the Irishmen and the English and the Spanish to borrow to bid up the prices again so the banks will be saved because the banks are our clients and they essentially the banks have taken over your government there and that's what's made your government so rotten. Uh, especially the social democratic parties that are, uh, essentially are the main bank lobbyists today. That's the irony that uh, it's the left wing of the political spectrum, the social democrats and the socialist parties that have become the bank lobbyists and are what we used to call the right wing of the spectrum. And uh, there's a confusion that uh, so much of the social democracy has been aimed at attacking industry and attacking manufacturing and attacking employers that they don't realize that the employers themselves have been taken over by the banks and the fight against that used to be the fight the class struggle against uh, the employers is now a struggle of the entire economy industry and labor alike against the banks and you have to solve that bigger struggle before we can go back to the familiar old class struggle of uh, uh, profits versus wages yeah brilliant response once again Michael just to pick you up on one or two points because you've been very kind with your time so far and you know we don't want to spend too much longer because I know you've got other pressing priorities no doubt one issue that I would like to just raise with you is a follow on from your answer why does quantitative easing seem to be the only monetary and or, or fiscal policy measure that governments and central banks around the world are prepared to offer? I mean, I might well, be a rhetorical question, Michael, but it would be great to get your, your answer because there seems to be from governments and central banks that the panacea to this is more quantitative easing and more quantitative easing. And you've just given an answer how that policy doesn't get into the real economy. So why does this seem to be the only thing that they're prepared to offer? Because the economic discipline has turned into essentially censorship. Uh, it's turned into a tunnel vision to, uh, and the European Constitution itself uh, says that, uh, bank, that the central bank can only lend to other banks 
not the government. Well, that's crazy. The whole reason the Bank of England was created, the Federal Reserve was created in America, uh, the, uh, the Russian Central Bank, the Chinese Central Bank, this, the purpose of the Central Bank is to monetize the government deficit. Government deficits are supposed to grow. Because as I think Stephanie Kelton explained in your earlier interview with her, the purpose of running a deficit is to pump money into the economy to enable the economy to expand. That's why government debt has gone up in every single economy. When the government debt goes up, this is a result of spending money into the economy to help the economy to expand. That's basic uh, Keynesian analysis. Uh, and that's not what is uh, occurring right now. Uh, that instead, uh, the central banks of Europe is prevented from uh, doing this. So Europe doesn't have a treasury like the United States uh, have a treasury. Okay, thank you. And really, just the last question that we would like to ask you today, Michael, is about what you referred to a little while ago about the, the old battle between labor and capital. And just some startling statistics. I don't know if you've managed to see them coming out of the States this week, but of course, is mirrored across Europe that incomes have dropped more now than since at the, at the beginning of what people are calling the recovery, if there is a recovery out there, which we know there isn't, than during the recession itself. And that the overall median income is 7.2% below its 2007 December level. So what we're seeing now is that several years down the line, incomes are dropping even further than at the beginning of the recession when a lot of companies and indeed governments were cutting back quite drastically. And we've seen very famous economists like Jamie Galbraith saying that one of the biggest measures that we could take to help is raise the minimum wage. Is this something that you would agree with? And what other policies do you think that could be directed at labour that could help the economy? Well, first of all, uh, the, you've been suckered into asking the wrong question. The problem isn't simply that incomes have gone down. It's that more and more of the income has to be spent on debt service and on paying economic rent. In the United States, 40% of workers' income now goes for housing, mainly because of mortgage debt. Uh, about 15% goes for other uh, debt, uh, education debt, uh, bank debt, credit card debt. So the problem is that not only uh, is what the workers receive uh, shrinking, uh, but also in America, the wage set-asides for Social Security and Medicare are now more than 15% of income. In uh, Latvia, the, the, uh, uh, the tax on labor is 59% uh, uh, flat set of flat tax. 59%. So that uh, the real thing to look at is disposable personal income, not uh, not uh, overall income. Uh, and the disposable personal income, after paying debt service, after paying economic rent, uh, health care and other things, uh, is uh, essentially shrinking. Uh, and so it's, so it's much worse. You want to track uh, the decline in, uh, in uh, what the income is paid for, and the only way of raising what the worker ends up with and what the worker is concerned about is what they can take home. Uh, after the wage set aside, after the wage deduction, after the wage withholding, after paying the nut of paying uh, the bank debt, the mortgage debt, the auto debt if they have it, the education debt, it's the, it's the after fire sector payments that you're concerned with, uh, and so someone has to redo uh, these uh, statistics to see what is it that labor actually ends up with, not merely its nominal wage, because the nominal wage uh, is not what the uh, workers get anymore. Michael, I think that's a perfect point to end on, and a very insightful and illuminating point to end on, that anybody who is watching this on our YouTube channel, USI Live 2012, or our iTunes channels, that actually the real facts and data that we need to be looking at in order to get a greater handle on the pain that many indeed working people across the world are going through at the moment. It really only leaves me to thank you Michael for your time and spending it with us today. We hope 
we hope that this isn't the last conversation that we have with you because some of the ideas that you have spoken about today, the concept of debt jubilees in particular, is something that should be given greater oxygen and uh, be disseminated to a wider audience. We hope to do that through our media streams in the UK and Ireland to be able to give some of the fantastic ideas that you've got, the insight that you've got out to a wider audience in order to tackle this economic mantra of neoliberalism and Thatcherite policies that are being rolled out across the world. So thank you on behalf of the USI very much indeed, Michael. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and your audience.